There are four places in the book of Matthew that Jesus rebukes his disciples for their little faith. I want you to write these down because they really have something to do to where we are today. Four places in the book of Matthew that Jesus rebukes his disciples for their little faith. First, from the Sermon on the Mount, he rebukes them when we begin to worry about provision and we worry about tomorrow. And this is what Jesus said in Matthew 6.30. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he, not, will he not much more clothe you, you of what? Little face. And it was a rebuke for those that would worry about tomorrow and the provision of God. The second place is when they, the disciples got caught in a storm and felt that Jesus is not involved in their crisis. In fact, Jesus is sleeping in the boat while they're going through the, through the, through the storm. I, I wanted just to send a news bulletin to the disciples just to go, he's there in the boat. Whether he's sleeping or awake, Jesus is with you. And this is what it says. And he said to them, why are you afraid, you men of what? Then he got up, rebuked. I like that he got up, which means he was rebuking them from his sleeping position. Then he got up, rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. Third place was when Peter sank after walking on water. Matthew 14, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, took hold of him, and said, you of what? Little faith, why did you doubt? And finally, when the disciples were misinterpreting the words of Jesus, Jesus was saying to them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And it says in verse 8 of Matthew 16, but Jesus, aware of this, said, you men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Because they were misinterpreting what Christ meant by this. Jesus was saying to them, you need faith to fight these battles. You need faith in the first one to fight anxiety about provision and tomorrow, what you're gonna face. Some of you have an anxiety of thinking about going back to work and of going even to classes or whatever that looks like for summer school. But he says you need faith to fight anxiety. Secondly, he tells them in that second portion, you need faith to know that God cares and that he is attentive and present in every storm that you're going through. Faith to believe that God does care and that he is present. Number three, you need faith to believe that God is able to help you move forward, really to take the next step, even when you feel like the ground could be shaky and not even solid, as for, was for Peter walking on water. And finally, you need faith to know God's voice, when he speaks and how he speaks. These, these are so important. Little faith is a huge problem when you're dealing with provision and the future, storms and needing to hear the voice of God. And Jesus was telling us all these things need, especially in the darkest of times, we need a strong faith. Dark times needs strong faith. Jot this down. Faith is believing God in spite of appearances and obeying God in spite of consequences. Let me say that again. Faith is believing God in spite of appearances, no matter what's in front of us, and in spite of consequences. Now here comes the big question all of you have been asking, and that's this. How is K faith? when faith starts with F. I know that's what you're going. You're thinking I'm losing it halfway through the alphabet here, but let me, let me help you. And it's because of this. Faith is built on the knowledge of God. Faith is built. See, I told you I, I, I had something up my sleeve today that, it, folks, I'm just telling you, a biblical worldview on faith has, has to have, understand what this is. Get, understand this, see, because when there's little faith, it's because people believe in a little God. Or let me just say it to you this way. Simple as this. Great faith has a great God. Little faith has a little God. And, and that, that's why it's all centered and founded in the knowledge of God, which I'll give you this verse that I was blindsided with. Because I had a number of things I was going to do, and I know some of everybody's been going. Is it the kingdom of God? Is it kindness and the fruit of the Spirit? I even thought about doing it on kids, but I'll wait for why for youth and speak to the next generation. But then I ran into this passage in 2 Peter that challenged me. Remember that when you're reading the book of Peter, Peter is writing to Christians living in difficult times, dark times. They're being killed and hunted for their faith. 
And this is his last verse after two epistles, after two letters he writes. For those that may be new in the faith, when you say epistle, it's not, that doesn't mean the wife of an apostle. Epistle means letter. Some of you going like, hey, you have Mrs. Epistle and Mr. Apostle. That's not what it means. This is the last verse in his last book, even before Peter was going to become a martyr. And it really is in a prayer, just as Ricardo was leading us in that final song called The Blessing, which was a prayer. As you were singing the ending of it, amen, that's how this verse ends. And here's where I got blindsided by Kay as I was getting ready, kingdom of God and all these things, and then following fast on the heels of grace is this verse. This is what he says. He goes in 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace, and here it comes, and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a challenge for us on the heels of grace to grow in the knowledge because that has the foundation of faith. I'll get there in a second. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. See, growing in the knowledge of God that Peter was challenging with means I don't know enough about God that I need to grow in that. When I become a Christian, I know enough for salvation, but knowing enough is growing in that. So I love what one of, our, one of the guest speakers we had here at Times Square Church some years ago, Johnny Erickson Tata, said it like this, one of the most wonderful things about knowing God is that there's always so much more to know, so much more to discover. And just when we least expect it, she says, he intrudes into our neat and tidy notions about who he is and how he works. Here's what I want you to get down. Every battle you face is a test of faith. And every test of faith is a challenge to show, or it's, it's really for you to know, how big your God is. Let me say that again. Every battle is a test of faith, and every test of faith is a challenge to how big God is. See, that's why the knowledge of God, that 2 Peter 3.18, that Peter was asking us on the heels of grace to grow in, the knowledge of God is the key ingredient of faith. Now, I want to say something that, I've been, that's been, that I think is going to be, I don't know how, I'll just say it. Here we go. I, I, this is what, there is battles that are going on when I think of Stan and Natasha that lead our 212 and the next gen from high school to college, junior high. And there's this big thing that's happening with, with the next generation. And they call it, let me just give you the big word, they call it deconstructing your faith. And what they're doing is you're having, you're having young people that are beginning to throw God, to throw God out and deconstructing and, and rebuilding something on a faulty foundation. And I want to say this. I think we have so many of the younger generation losing the battle for their soul because we have built, here it comes, here it comes. So just strap in and, and email me later. Here it comes. Because we have built a church today asking people to discover who they are instead of who God is. And so we have all these messages on you. Folks, you knowing you isn't gonna get you through any battle. You knowing who God is, is what begins to take. And folks, I'm here to tell you this. <laughs> okay, let me just get in more trouble. There, here it is. I just got back, so I, I, don't, I'm, I still don't care. So here we go. We, we, it, wasn't, it wasn't an issue. Church isn't so we can be somebody. We were meant to know somebody. We were meant to know God is what it is. That's the business of why we meet for church. Not you, but for him. And so we have lost it. And you know why people are de deconstructing their faith? Because we're missing who he is. Do you understand? We are trying to discover how strong we are and we forget our strength is finite. I want to know an infinite God. I want to know how great God is. See, it's by knowing God is how you fight a good fight.
When there is a knowledge of who you can find, it's not you knowing, I gotta know my gifts and I gotta take that gift test and I've gotta go through and find out if, what my Enneagram is and I'm a, am I, you know, am I shade pink or am I a number 10 or am I a, I don't care. I want to know God is great. I want to know God is awesome. So while you're discovering you, I want to grow in the knowledge of who God is. I want to know. And folks, listen, I, I'm still surprised every week that we even have people showing up here. We're all the way at a K. And we still have like 16 more letters to go. But just stay with me. I'll empty the church out soon enough. Because when we come together, church... Prayer, Bible reading, and fellowship is boot camp for the battle. That's what it is. We have to equip you to walk in dark times. And folks, let me just say, battles are coming. And for you, they're already here. I remember a young man um, that came to the Lord in one of our last churches that Cindy and I were at. Charismatic personality. Everybody loved Donnie. He was, he was um, so lovable and so charismatic, but so immature. He, uh, he came to me and said, he said, Pastor Tim, I've been praying and the Lord has spoken to me. I said, okay, tell me, Donnie, what is it? He said, the Lord has finally told me, after, he's been saved like for six months. He said, I'm done with battles. I have graduated and I have no more battles to deal with. I said, are you dying? Because like, that only happens when you're dead. <laughs> I said, if you're alive, I wanted to go, oh, my charismatic friend. Um, <laughs> there's, you're about to get a battle just because you said there's no more battles. <laughs> See, when your faith is being tested, then your knowledge of God is being challenged. That's, that's, what if, that's what it does. Let me look at these battle verses and you tell me the common word, the common theme of the fight. Here it comes. Listen to it. First Peter, Peter reminds us and he says this, you are extremely happy about these things even though you have to suffer different kinds of trouble for a little while now. And then Peter says this, the purpose of these troubles is to what? Test your faith as fire tests how genuine gold is. Your faith is more precious than gold. And by passing the test, it gives praise, glory, and honor to God. James says it like this. Consider it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your what? Faith will produce endurance. Paul tells Timothy about this kind of battle. And he says in 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of And finally, think of what Jesus said to Peter as he was about to enter into one of the darkest moments of his life and says, Peter, I've prayed for you. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired, has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your what? Faith may not fail. And when once you have turned again, strengthen your brother. Here, here it is. Get, the, get this down. Every battle is a faith fight. And every fight comes to twist, distort, disrupt, and misrepresent who God is. I, I want to say that again. Every battle that you're going through is a faith fight. And if the foundation of faith is the knowledge of God, then the goal of that, that uh, the, the demonic fight is to misconstrue, skew, disrupt who God is. C.S. Lewis was fighting that kind of fight and the twisting of God. His wife was dying of cancer before his eyes, Joy Davidman. He married her. She had a couple of children. She was a widow. And shortly into this storybook marriage, Joy is diagnosed with cancer. And in C.S. Lewis's book, A Grief Observed, it, it has to be one of, the, uh, 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 one of the most raw, pieces of literature I've ever read because it wasn't meant to be published. It was his journal of what he was going through as he's watching. C.S. Lewis, this man of faith, this man who comes to faith and his writings have touched so many. But this is where the faith fight comes. Remember, every battle is a faith fight. And what's the fight? It comes to twist, disrupt, and construe, and misrepresent who God is. 
Listen to these words from his journal. I want you to see this. You want, you're going to want to take a picture of this because it's so important. Listen to what he says. He, this is how he writes in his journal when he's at his darkest time in his faith fight when, he's, when, when Satan is trying to misconstrue who God is. This is what he wrote. Not that I'm in danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is of coming to believe such dreadful things about him. The conclusion I dread is not, so there's no God after all, but this is my conclusion I dread, so this is what God's really like. Do you see how raw that is? That was the faith fight. He's fighting this moment. As he's looking at his wife struggling with cancer, the enemy is trying to misconstrue and play with that faith fight. This is the way God is. This is who he is. And try, that's why the knowledge of God is the foundation of this kind of, 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 of our faith. When God gets blurry, the battle can easily be lost when we lose who God is. Folks, that's why, let me say it like this. Get this. Don't try to get more faith. Simply pursue to know God more. Faith automatically comes. Let me say that again. Don't, don't just pursue faith. Pursue the knowledge of God. Pursue to know God more. Know his character, his faithfulness. Know his strength. Know his loving kindness. Know his justice. Know his holiness. As you know God more, faith arises in us. Where do we get the knowledge of God? We get that from the word of God. As we open up this word, every single time we come here, we better be in this word because this is where our, the knowledge of God comes. Last Sunday, I wasn't here because I kept a promise I made to someone over three years ago. And it was a promise. I'm so thankful our general overseer, Pastor Carter, was here. Thank God. I'm so, so appreciative every time he stands in this pulpit. It was a promise to speak at an event in, in France. And people have asked me, how did it go? I've, I've heard that probably for the last three days as we got in the middle of last week. And my answer is unexpectedly amazing. Like I was keeping a promise and had no idea what I was getting ready to walk into. And so because I, the, the truth of the matter is because I hate leaving um, TSC on Sunday, I, I, there is not a place I would rather be at than right here every single, I'm just telling you, there's not a place I'd rather be. But I had to keep a promise. So I went missing you all and probably that's why I, I didn't have a lot of expectation. I didn't know what I was getting into. But folks, I'm telling you, when I walked into this place, I, there was 2,500 young people there. Um, from high school to college, packed this place out. And I have to tell you, I don't think both in America and in Europe, I've ever seen such hunger amongst the next generation. I'm going to tell you, I looked at Jennifer, wave your hand in the choir, I can't barely, Je Jennifer's from Paris, and I looked at Jennifer and I just simply said this, I just said, I have hope for France. I said, when I saw your next generation, and I saw these young people crying out to God, folks, on Saturday night, this is what they asked me, they said, would you do these ABCs that you do in New York, do the ABC thing? <laughs> folks. I saw, I, I did it just like you did. We, we have a whole video of them doing the prayer in French. I sent it to some of our elders. We watched 600 young people respond to be born again. 600 young people. Then they prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit till some two in the morning on Sunday night. And, and, I, and, and, and my heart was just bursting to go, God is doing, and, and those that are watching from France, I believe God is raising up a generation of young people to do something powerful in your country. Anybody here from France, would you raise your hand? Raise your hand. I want to make sure I over there, I want to make sure I don't miss anybody who's from France, but I want to believe that God is going to do over there, that God is going to do something great in your country. And, and my heart was just, and, and when I saw the 600 come down to respond to, to come to an altar and respond. I knew why I was there. I knew why God, was, why God called me there. Um, and that's why it was so unexpected. 
But as we were leaving, we, we flew to Zurich, Switzerland, because it was close to the, where the venue was, where we were speaking at. Um, we flew into Zurich, and Cindy and I were going through security, and as we're finishing up in security, just a few feet away from us are hundreds of boxes of cigarettes at the duty-free store, hundreds. And so you, you go out, and there it is, cigarettes right before the Swiss chocolates and perfumes are massive amounts of cartons of cigarettes. And Cindy looked at me, she goes, that's amazing. As big as the brand were these giant letters, smoking kills. It was huge. It was like, and I'm going, well, that should fix it. Kills. That didn't fix anything. People just, just buying cigarettes. I mean, there it is, and they're buying duty-free cartons of cigarettes with the big thing, swiping carts, and there, the giant sign, smoking kit. It wasn't, it wasn't like this little asterisk, and you needed a magnifying glass. Folks, I'm telling you, I think it was bigger than Marlboro. It was smoking kills, and it did and yet people didn't care, didn't read it, and still run the risk of dying of cancer, regardless of what was, what was written there. And I have to tell you, all I thought about was this. I thought about this word. If you don't read this, I'm telling you, it will kill your faith. I'm telling you right, I'm telling you, if you think Sunday and sometime on Tuesday, is going to help you walk through dark time, you've got to know who God is. You've got to get a refreshing course of the knowledge of God. And because when this isn't part of your curriculum and your every day, I'm telling you, it's, there's a thousand things trying to fill your mind and misconstrue who God is. But I'm here to tell you, there's one place that if we don't get here, this will kill us if we don't open this book. This, every pope, I don't care if you're a leader around the country, around the world, and this is what we preach. This is what we say. This is the spot that we have to stay grounded in. That's where it all happens. D.L. Moody said, I closed my Bible and prayed for faith, but now I open my Bible and began to study and faith began growing inside. Don't pray for faith. You grow in faith. And it starts in the word. How, Pastor Tim? Listen, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by and hearing by the... The more we read this book, the more we know God. And the more our faith is strengthened. See, faith comes as you respond to God's revelation of himself. As you open this and see something, you're going, that's true, that's God, that's what I have to believe. Faith starts to grow. Because when you grow in your knowledge of God, you grow in your faith. Now keep this in mind. The Bible never says, believe only, but believe on the Lord Jesus. It never says, have faith. It says, have faith in God. So, so because if you, if you take away the object of faith, then it's just a feeling. It's this abstract hope or attitude. Faith finds its growth and power in what it has put faith in. I, folks, it's not, I don't have faith. I have faith in God. I don't have belief. I have belief in Jesus. Because biblical faith always depends upon its object. If you're, that's why, listen, you can have, let me put it to you this way. If, if I have small faith, but thick ice, I can walk across a frozen pond. But if I have great faith and on thin ice, you're going to die. So that's why Jesus said, even if you have a little bit of faith, a tiny bit, God is thick ice. You can walk across that thing and just, God goes, I'm good enough. I'm good enough and great enough that all you have to make sure is that your object and your focus is on him. Your faith is only as great as the God as you believe in. He is the object of our faith. Faith without Jesus, faith without God, it's not faith at all. 
And this is a battle for this. This is a battle for this thing. So how does Satan attack our face? Remember, it's always by messing up, misconstruing, and, 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 and taking God and beginning to disrupt the biblical view of who God is. Let me talk to you now about what it means to walk in darkness in this time. This is the part that I was challenged with. I want you to, I want you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 50, and this is why this is important. Here it is. This is the faith part in these last days. This is the part that challenged me. When I came across that second Peter verse, my heart went right to Isaiah chapter 50. Listen to these words. Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, here it comes, that walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, it's talking about your fire. This is when you choose not faith, but you choose to get out of a situation yourself. He says, behold, all you who try to kindle a fire in your dark moment, who encircle yourselves with firebrands and walk in the light of your fire and among the brands you've set ablaze. This is you trying to get yourself out of a dark situation. This you will have from my hand. You'll lie down in torment. See, here's what's confusing to me, because I want you to see who's in the dark. Can you put up Isaiah 50, 10 one more time? Here's what is confusing. Who is among you that fears the Lord, obeys, obeys the voice of his servant? Here it comes. And walks in darkness and has no... Folks, this isn't some backslidden person. This is a person that fears the Lord. This is a person that obeys God. It's not a person that's being disciplined. This is a person that God is going, this is your test of faith to see, will you trust me? Because that's what it says. What do you do when there is no light and it's dark? This is what he says. Trust in the name of the Lord God and rely on his God. That's what he said. He says, because the warning is, don't set your own fire here. Don't, don't get yourself out. Don't try single person. Don't, 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 don't come up with your own plans to fix your singleness. Thought I'd say that. He says, because when you do that, torment is on the other side. When you try to come up with your own, if God turns out the lights for a moment, he's saying what I'm doing here is I'm getting you to trust in the name of the Lord and to rely upon your... Folks, let me just say this. There is, there's a, when I'm going through a difficult time and a dark time, there is a hymn that gets me through dark times. I'm going to tell you, it's that old hymn. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus. But you know, how many know that song? And I just, and there's times that I'm, when I'm walking through dark, I'll just go, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on come on sing the chorus and lift your hands on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand wall. Okay, but where I really sing, the bit where I get loud is on this part. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest. That's on in every high, in every high. Oh, come on, sing this part loud. My on Christ the solid rock. Come on. Sinking sad. Oh. Hallelujah. When darkness seems to
to hide his face. That's the misconstruing part. That's the battle of, because that's what darkness does. When God puts you in that dark place, it's a test, it's a, it's a fight of faith. It's a faith fight. And what's the fight? Is that I don't see who you are. So I'm called to trust and rely on what I've learned in boot camp every single time. Not what I've learned about me, but what I've learned about you. Because you, listen to me, listen to me, all, everybody that wants to know all the, everything about yourself, let me help you. Here it is. You can't get you through any battle. Okay, some of you I know are offended, so let me, let me say it again the same way. You can't get you through any battle. But I know somebody that can get me through every single battle that I go through. Because when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. Through every high and stormy gale, hallelujah, my anchor holds within the veil. What do you do when the lights go out? When we are in the dark and can't see our way, that's when we have to remember what we've learned in boot camp, the knowledge of God. We have to call upon what we've studied in this word. I, I, my mind went back to the most decorated Olympic athlete, Michael Phelps, the swimmer. 28 medals, and 23 of them are gold. But my favorite gold medal story is what happened in Beijing. Now, his coach, Bob Bowman, gave Phelps such a knowledge of the pool, his strokes, and uh, just everything before he gets into, the, into the, the big competitions. They said Bowman at University of Michigan at times would, would sabotage his practices. They said he would take pinholes and poke holes in his goggles so when he jumped in and water started filling up, he had to learn to swim when the water started. He said sometimes... When he jumped in, he would turn off the lights and it would be absolutely pitch black in the natatorium, but he had to finish it. And so what he had to do is he had to know the pool. He had to know how many strokes on each turn, when the wall was coming up, when to do the flip turn. Even when the lights get turned off, he was familiar because he practiced so much over and over again that a knowledge of the pool, the knowledge of the stroke, the knowledge of the course he was swimming, he knew what was going on. Okay, some of you got it. Some of you got it. I, oh, that, that lady and that guy's got it. But it's the, I know it's the 10 o'clock. The 1 o'clock sometimes is quicker, but here we go. <laughs> so he would train Michael in the dark to know how to swim when you couldn't see anything. When darkness seems to hide his face. And then it happened in Beijing, the Beijing Olympics. It was 9.56 a.m. Phelps stood behind the starting block, bouncing up on his toes. And when the announcer said his name, Phelps stood on the blocks and did what he did every time since he was age 12 as he flapped his arms three times, getting ready to jump in the pool. And Phelps, Michael Phelps said he knew something was wrong as soon as he hit the water, moisture started filling in his goggles. He couldn't tell if they were leaking from the bottom or the top, but as soon as he broke the water surface and began swimming, he was hoping that it was over, that that was it. But he said by the second turn for the finals, everything was getting blurry. And he said as he approached the third turn in the final lap, the cups of the goggles were completely filled. And Michael said, I couldn't see anything. I couldn't see the line the pool's bottom, the black tee marking the approach wall, I couldn't see anything. And at that moment, Phelps said this, then all the training kicked in. He said, all of a sudden, boot camp came to me. He said, because I already studied this. I have a knowledge of the pool. I have a knowledge of the stroke. I have a knowledge of how many it's going to take me. And Phelps said this. He said, he went, but when my coach would turn off the lights and I have to swim in the dark, he goes, it all came back to my memory. And so it all happened that when all of a sudden Michael estimated when he made the final turn, 
He said, Michael estimated, he says, I estimated how many strokes the final push would require. He said, I already knew it was 21 strokes. I already knew what I needed to do. So he said, all of a sudden, when I knew 21 strokes, I felt totally relaxed. He said, and midway through the lap, he said, I began my final, which is always his big thing, by his 18th stroke. He says, then I start my push. He said, I could hear the crowd roaring, but since I was blind, I had no idea if they were cheering for me or someone else. 19 strokes, then 20, and then when he got to his 21st stroke, he knew the glide was going to take him to the wall. When he ripped off his goggles, he looked up and saw his name, and it said, WR, world record. <laughs> Not only did he win a gold, he broke a world record, and he did it in the dark, which tells me when you know God, when you know who God is, when you know what you're, all of a sudden, you're going, I don't know where to go here, but I know who God is. I don't have to know a battle. I don't have to know the enemy. I don't have to know who I am. I just got to know who God is, and I get that W. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Stand with me, hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> Isaiah, Isaiah says there's two things you have to do in the dark. You trust in the name of the Lord and you rely on your God. That's what he says. He didn't say the lights go on. He didn't say, he says, but you're going to touch the wall. You're going to hit the wall. You go, how do you do that, Pastor Tim? You don't need to know how many strokes. You don't need to know it's 21 strokes. You just got to do this. He's faithful. He's good. He loves me. He's my father. And there you are at stroke 18. And there you go. And you're sitting there going, he's mighty. He's omniscient. And then the push. The push. Here it comes. He's omnipresent. And all of a sudden, you get right there. And you're going, he's there. He's there. He's there for me. He's there. Let me tell you something. To trust in the name of the Lord means to trust in his character. To trust what I've already studied in boot camp. That's why you come to church. Folks, listen. You come here to learn about God. We're not going to give you tests about you. We just can't. Why? That's not going to take you through anything. We want you trained in this. I love what the great healing evangelist Wigglesworth said. He said, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I am moved only by what I believe. That's it. That's it. That's where this comes in. That's where this comes in. That's swimming with, dark, with, with water in the goggles. It's swimming in the dark. That's what, that's what God has asked us to do. He's, he's, there's moments. So we train you to swim in the dark. We train you to walk in the dark. Because you're sitting here today. You're watching online. You're going, I've obeyed the Lord. I fear the Lord. But why are the lights turned out? Why are the lights turned out? Why did, why did the lights go out on me? I feel like I've done everything right. You know, Mark, Yuka, Barry, there's this, that section of that hymn, that first part. My hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. And here it comes. I dare not trust. What does it say, Kareem? You, the sweetest frame. But here it comes. But holy on Jesus' name. You know what he was saying? You know what frame is? He's like frame of mind. That's what he said. He says, I don't even trust my sweetest frame let alone trusting when I'm in a bad place. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. Here it comes, the goggles. 
I dare not trust the sweet, but holy what? On. That's what he says. That's how he says you get through the dark times. Because in those times, we live by promises, not by explanations. We live on the promises that we've learned. And here's good news for you. You're going to touch the wall. Here's the good news. You're going to hit the wall. It's going to not, you're going to go, ha, WR, world record. How in the world did I get through this? Here's good news. Psalm 112, verse 4. Even in darkness, what does it say? Light dawns for the upright. You may be going, some of you worship today with goggles on, filled. You can't even see tomorrow. You can't even see what you have to go back to that apartment for. But somehow, your knowledge of God made your hands go up. Strong faith in a strong God made those hands go up as you started to worship him. Goggles filled, child in a place, a marriage in a place, a body that's suffering with a sickness, and somehow with goggles filled, the blurriness of the future, doctors say three years, all those things come, and fear is starting to hit you. You're wondering what these pains are. You're wondering if, if I'm ever going to get my degree, how am I going to pay this school debt? What am I going to do? What are all these things? How am I going to pay? You, Stan's making a plea for a one-day retreat. You think, how am I going to pay for that? How are we going to do all these things? I want my kids to go here. And everything's getting blurry. But I'm telling you, get those hands ready and say, I trust in the name of the Lord. I trust in who he is right now. Oh, I feel so important. I just feel I'm supposed to do this. I, I really feel so I'm supposed to do this. If you're here today, and I, I, if you're coming to the one o'clock, I'll do, I, I, there's, I've got like other stuff, but let's not do that. Here's what I'm going to say. If you're here today and you're going, Pastor Tim, I'm here with, with blurry goggles, filled up with water. I can't see what's ahead. But this is a day I'm choosing to trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Balcony, main floor. It could be the annex and watch. If you're here in the building, I want you to get out of your seat right now. I want you to walk up here. I want us to pray for you right now. Quickly. You're going, I, you're going I, I, I'm, I'm in this pool and everything's getting blurry. Right? Balcony, come on. You come down. I want to pray for you wherever you're at. I want you to make your way down. I want us to get ready to pray for you right now. I just feel strongly that we need to pray for those. That just seems like everything has just gotten blurry. You can't even see tomorrow. And what God is going to do, I believe this is going to be a day where he is going to begin to encourage and bring balconies. You find the exits. You come down. Our ushers will lead you here. Annex, you stay right up there. Our teams will pray for you that are watching in our next building. Those that are online, you stay right there. You have workers online that will even pray with you. Just say, just put it, put, just go ahead. Those that are watching online, just, just put in the chat. Just say, I'm coming to the altar online, and they'll pray for you right now. They'll pray for you right now. Just say, I'm coming to the altar from France, from Thailand, from, from Russia, from China. I'm coming to the altar from Guyana and from South Africa. And we're going to wait because those in the balcony are making your way down. I want you just to lift your hands. I want you just to lift your hands right now all over this place. Trust in the name of the Lord. Trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon your God. Trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon your God. I want to believe right now that God is going to begin to do that. God is going to begin to do that. God is going to come right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I believe that you're going to start to take these that have felt like that they're swimming with nowhere to go, but right now, you're going to bring a new knowledge of God. God is faithful. God is holy. God is great. God is able. God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. God is omnipotent. I pray that they would go back to boot camp that scriptures would come to their mind. That, Father, that while they're swimming in the dark and while they're walking in the dark and, Father, realizing that this is just a test of faith, it's a battle of faith right now to know that God is still good even when the lights are out. God is still good even when the lights are out. God is still good when the lights are out. Oh, God, I just pray that right now that you're going to begin to touch these precious people that are coming down here. This is a moment. This is a moment that you're going to begin to give hope again, hope again, hope again, hope again, hope again. Church, stretch out your hand towards these at this altar right now. God, we're just going to believe this is a day of faith. Increase their faith by increasing their knowledge of you, Lord God. Oh, hallelujah. The wall, 
the finish line feels so far away, but God, I pray that today, that now, give them stamina. Let them walk and get there, knowing each way, each, each step they take, God is with them. God goes with them. This is that day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord God. Oh, we bless your name. We bless your name. Just a moment, I want to ask Rick Carter to lead us in something. But I want us just to, I want us to worship. I want us, can, can we, I, I, know, I know I'm like a broken record on this. Can we, can we do how great is our God? Can we just begin just to sing that? I, I, I don't know what, they sang that in French and, I, and I'm crying. We sing it in English, I'm crying. Because it's a reminder of the knowledge of God and who he is. You know, that, that, that as we sing that, Let's start with the verse. Um, it starts, Render of the King. Come on, sing it. Close. This is the knowledge of God part. This is going to get you ready for the swim. Listen to the second part. Listen, sing it now. He wraps himself. Hallelujah. Darkness tries to hide. This is how big God is and trembles. Hallelujah. Come on, lift those hands and voices.
we close in these next few minutes, some of you have walked away from God. You have, the battle, the dark moment has misconstrued him, has distorted, that's the word I'm looking for, has distorted him. He's become distorted. So what you've done is you're just going, I don't want to be part of that. I, 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 I hear it all the time. Because you thought you can get through something without him. There's none of us that can. The thing that helps me through my fight of faith is my knowledge of God. That's it. The knowledge of God. I'm just telling you, every time those lights go out, I just remember who he is. Every time the lights go out, faithful, just, good. I'm, I just keep swimming because I know who he is. And so, some of you have lost that faith. You thought you needed to deconstruct. And I know I'm saying that sarcastically because I meant to say it sarcastically. And so I'm going to deconstruct. And so I'm going to, and it doesn't work. Listen to me, those that are watching online because you're afraid to come here, but you're secretly watching. I know. So you're going, how does he know? How does he know? How does he know? You're going, These are special cameras. We can see right, right? <laughs> Special. These aren't special cameras. And you deconstructed this thing, and, and you're still ending up flapping in the water and doggy paddling because you can't get to the other side. And I'm telling you, this is a day to stop and say, I want you in my life, God. Come back in my life today. Come back and change me today. Some of you have walked away from God. You're raised in church. You've walked away from him. And you've chosen alternative lifestyles. You've chosen things about you to lead you. Maybe visiting New York City, and you said, I've chosen this, and I've chosen to be known as this, and I've chosen all these things. And I'm telling you, that never will bring you through. It's who he is. That's who it is. He's the, he defines us. He defines us. You don't need a t-shirt. You don't need anything else to define you. God defines us. And you've walked away and you're going, it hasn't worked. My definition of me and this is me. Put it all aside and just go, I want God back in my life. I want, I want God to come in because I'm tired of missing everything. And with every head up, every eye open, watching online, if you're here today and say, I've been away from the Lord, but I got to come back to him today. I want God to come in and change you. Hold up your hands. Say, pray for me. Pray for me. Hold it up high. Hold it up high. I've been away from him. He's got you. He's got you. Well, keep your hands up. You've, been, you've walked away. You've walked away. Keep them up high. Balcony all over the balcony. Look at all these. Got you in the back. All, all of these hands. All of these hands. Come on. I want you to pray. Listen, I, I want you to pray. I want this to be a prayer of renewal. I know we sometimes always pray the ABC. I'll save that for the next service. But right now, come on. Just say these words. Just say, Jesus, I'm coming home. I thought I could do it myself. I thought I can come up with my own way. But I realized today, this has been a fight of faith. And you became distorted in my mind. The enemy has succeeded in making you small. But today I realized, God is great. God is strong. And God is for me. I come home today like a prodigal. I feel your open arms. And today is the day of salvation. Today is a day of renewal. And thank you, Jesus. You've never left me. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Come on, put your hands.